um, welcome back to our uh, Q&A session on uh, why doing a PhD in computer science in uh, Germany. And next is a very important question, I guess. I think we, we touched the topic money uh, a little bit in the, in the other um, areas of questions before, but now um, let, let's talk a little bit more in, in detail about it. So where, where does the money for a PhD actually come from? And maybe also how is that related to the, the application process in the end? So yeah. maybe as a first question, um, uh, how expensive is a PhD candidate for you, Professor Karl? How much money do you have to? Das muss ich nachrechnen. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, roughly about 140,000 euro per year. Something okay. like that. Uh, you don't get all of that, right? Uh, a lot of it is lost in the university administration. We have to pay for, I don't know, room rent, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, around, around about 140, 150K, right? That, so take, multiply this by four years. So one PhD easily costs half a million euro, probably more. I see. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, keep in mind when you apply for the job, this is the amount of money you are asking, right? You are asking half a million euro plus. So just to get, get some idea. Now, where does that money come from? Yeah, um, that would be the next question. <laughs> exactly. So there's mainly three sources of funding. Let's start with the smallest one, with the least important one. The least important one are personal scholarships that exists. This is given out by companies like, I don't know, the Googles, Volkswagen, Microsoft, etc., etc. There you personally apply directly, typically, there's deviations, but typically they directly apply, apply to such a company or um, foundation, eine Stiftung, um, and say, hey, I'm a great guy. I deserve to be given money to do a PhD. And then you, I, and if you get that money, then you actually can go with that money, with the agreement for that funding. You go to a possible advisor and say, hey, I'm self-funded, right? And then this is, this is so much easier, right? Um, for international students, an important special case of that case are the so-called DAAD scholarships, Deutscher Akademischer Austauschdienst, German Academic Exchange Service. They provide similar scholarships, um, and then you can apply with your own funding. Um, for that, however, you need to do your master abroad, and then you use that scholarship to come to Germany. That's an important special case for that. Okay, so that, that's scholarships. Number two, is positions funded directly by the university. And since the university gets its money from, from the land, from the region, from the state government here in North Rhine-Westphalia, so this is basically taxpayers' money coming from the state via the university. Why does the university do that? Because if you're on such a position, you're expected to teach, right? Mm -hmm. You're expected to assist in teaching typically bachelor classes, to some degree master classes, to do seminars, homework assignments, tutorials, uh, project groups, blah, 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 right? So you have these typical four, four hours a week of teaching duties, and that goes into tutoring and so on and so forth, right? Now, this is one exception to what I said earlier, um, because teaching in the bachelor happens in German. For these types of positions, you need to speak German, typically at least at C1 level or better. So almost native speaker level, right? So this is tough, right? If you're not a German native speaker, getting a C1 level is not an easy job to do. And, but this is, there's just no way around that for that type of positions. You need that, that level of, of language aptitude to engage in teaching classes on a bachelor level. Uh, okay, and so then may, may, I may ask please, uh, one, please, one please, intermediate please. question. Okay, because um, uh, you were talking about this teaching assistance uh, positions. So mm -hmm. I think there's, um, there's something that people could actually uh, Google how much money they would get out of it, right? It's, it's uh, TVL13, is that the, the it's, right uh, name? TV, for TVL E13, yes. Um, okay. TVL, Tarifvertrag der Länder. Uh, pff, how to translate that? My God. Um, this doesn't matter. It's possible, sort of the yeah. payment scale. It's the payment yeah. scale. Uh, you look for an E13. Um, uh, yeah. That's that's the, the payment scale you get there. And maybe something to point out, because I know that it is different from discipline to discipline. So if you are in the in, in other sciences, you might not get mm -hmm. a full full. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, good funding, point. Good. But it, yeah. yeah. 
Good point. That's, so that's typically, good yeah. yeah, typically in CS you get a hundred percent funded position, but that also means you have a forty-hour uh, work week, right? <clears throat> Excuse me, forty hours. Yeah, sure. Um, Which no, you uh, might have in other disciplines for still, even for, if you for, just get paid fifty percent of the money. But yeah. And sometimes you get fifty <laughs> or one one third, or if you are in humanities yeah. or something, you're happy if you get one quarter of a position, yeah. right? As, as, well, what can I say for for those disciplines? Not not my problem. Really. Okay, yeah. um, let's circle back. So we have the teaching positions, E13, 100% funded, typically. You can get a 50% funded position if you want to, but that's really rare. Um, the third of the three main funding sources are projects, meaning that the university, alone or together with other partner organizations, applies for so-called third-party funding. That funding can come from the government, federal, state, regional, city government. It can come from the from research foundations like the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, DFG. It can come from industry directly. It can come from the European Union. There's tons of possible sources mm -hmm. for that such type of money. Um, and that boils down into a project where you sign as the university, you sign a contract with the third party funder. We will do research on the following topic and we attempt to provide within two years the following results, blah, 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 right? And then so you get it, money. Is it, is, it is it engineering in the end? You, you get some kind of there is a there <laughs> is a There is a risk of engineering, but that depends how you set up these, uh, these proposals. What, if, you, if, you write the pro if you know what you do when you're writing a proposal, you are guaranteeing that you will undertake research on the topic. You're not mm -hmm. guaranteeing results. I see. Right? The difference is an engineering problem can be solved by applying the methods of the field in a structured way. For a research problem, it's an open question, right? I see. So that's, that's the difference there. So if you're doing it right, you end up um, writing proposals where you promise to do research and not you promise to deliver a product. By the way, that's then the difference between, for example, a Fraunhofer, uh, a Fraunhofer proposal and position. They typically, since they are much more industry oriented, they typically have to promise products, results. We have to provide effort, right? Mm -hmm. That's the difference there. Now, um, what was I saying? Projects, right? So yeah. who is going to do that uh, effort in undertaking these projects? PhD candidates. Right, so we hire somebody on an E13 payment scale again to do those projects, right? And this is a point where there's actually also a difference to this autonomy. If you're working on such third party funded projects, there's usually, usually less autonomy than if you're on a university funded position or certainly less than if you're on a scholarship, right? Because then there's, hey, here's a proposal, here's a contract. Yeah. We need to fulfill that contract. We need to do this, this and that, right? And then this, this limits your autonomy. You typically have still autonomy in how to approach that, but your topic is much more constrained, right? Maybe so that's, that, there, that's, there's a difference there. Maybe that's a, a, a good, good point to, to also ask of uh, Florian and Tobias. I mean, if, 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 if I'm hearing this now or putting myself into the position of, a, of someone who is thinking about doing a PhD, I would now, I would now have the question, do, do I have a choice in the end? Or am I, is it more like I'm approaching a professor and this professor tells me, okay, we have this and this projects that we are currently searching people for, or should I, I don't know, approach the professor and say, I wanna, I wanna have it funded in this way. Uh, uh, does it work for me? So, and maybe, maybe that as a question for Florian and Tobias, I mean, how, how were you paid? What was your type of um, uh, PhD that you uh, were funded by? So I had uh, most of the time um, a university position um, and um, as PhD candidate, uh, you have the choice. I mean, you apply uh, for a position. So, uh, okay. uh, for example, a research group has uh, multiple open positions and um, in, that, um, uh, in that listing it is um, written if it is uh, for a special project or if it's a, a university contract and so on. Mm -hmm. So you have to talk um, to your advisor, um, to the professor, um, for what um, for what you want to apply, um, and uh, yeah, having having a project uh, position um, has the advantage um, that um, you are not involved um, for teaching. Um, but um, 
also gives you the direction of research. Um, so for uh, some specific um, topic of the project. Um, with university, you are much, um, have much more choices um, for that, but you also um, have to do teaching, which sounds negative, but it isn't, because um, I think um, teaching is, is a very important aspect of doing a PhD, because um, uh, you learn how to explain um, topics, how to explain stuff um, to people. Um, which is um, uh, important in, in, in that sense, because if you just understand it um, or applying um, uh, uh, in your research, it doesn't uh, mean you're able to explain it to others. So I see. Also yeah. something um, you learn during your PhD while doing teaching, um, how to um, explain uh, complex yeah. um, uh, complex um, uh, uh, structures, uh, complex uh, topics to other students. Maybe you could uh, talk about that a little bit more when we are uh, soon talking about the everyday life of a PhD student. So then that's maybe a good point to talk about that. Um, uh, Toby, what is, how is your uh, position uh, uh, funded? Uh, I'm, I applied for a position that is um, funded by the uh, government. So I'm, I was getting paid for teaching, um, but there was a break for about six months, nine months where I was working for a project um, and now back again in, in teaching. Ah. Um, I mean, I, I agree with Florian. Um, this, this teaching is, um, I mean, it, it sounds a bit easy. You, you stand in front of some people and then you explain stuff, um, but in order to be able to do so, um, you really have to understand the topic you are talking about. Um, and that is actually difficult or di more difficult than I expected in the beginning um, and at least for me this, this this teaching is closely related to my PhD topic um, which was not the case for for the project and um, so the project was not even close to my daily research stuff um, so from from my point of view this this teaching duties were the the better option for me mm -hmm. Okay, uh, maybe to, to wrap it up a bit, yeah, okay. Hey, I think two, two more comments here, please. Yeah. Um, I understand you want to wrap up, I, I'll be quick. Um, <laughs> so, as Tobias has pointed out, there's clearly the case that people switch from position to position. This is totally normal and this is totally standard procedure. It's extremely rare that somebody stays on the same project and or the same time position for, for the whole duration of a PhD. Sure, it can happen, but this is totally the exception. So don't, don't worry, right? Just because it's, oh, I only have a two-year contract for, for this project. Yeah, that's normal, right? Uh, normal, normal operation. Also, Project does not equal project, right? It makes a big difference if you have a direct industry funded project on something that is close to a product um, versus you have a large European Union project where you have work package lead for five or 10 international partners. And every two, two months you, you travel around Europe or nowadays you don't travel, but um, mm -hmm. uh, versus you do a DFG funded basic research project, which is just funding for you personally alone, right? There are so many different types of project. It highly depends on what, what you're talking about. It's impossible to, 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 to all treat that the same. And uh, your question earlier on, of course you can ask. Of course you can talk to, to a possible prospective advisor. Hey, I think I'd be better on a, on a teaching position than on in such and mm -hmm. such position. But it might also just be the case that there is no position in that type available, right? Makes sense. Tough, yeah. is tough luck, right? Such is life. Okay, thanks for the input here. So um, I think we, we talk now extensively about the, the different forms of, of funding a PhD, which, which included the scholarship, which is rather a rare option we, we learned. And then the more, the two more um, uh, usual ones like projects and uh, to do it with uh, uh, public federal money for teaching assistance. Um, maybe now, and I think uh, um, uh, Toby and uh, Professor Karl also pointed out that there's these forms of mixture or switches in, be in between the different uh, forms of funding. So maybe let's talk a little bit uh, more about, um, I mean, I, I would call it some kind of special formats uh, because we got some questions about, can we, I don't know, mix a PhD with a job? Can we do it mm. uh, part-time? Um, 
I think that is that. Let's do. Let's start with these two questions. Is is it possible, for example, at uh, your group to do a part time PhD? Would you accept that? Would you accept industry corporations or or not? Mm. Uh, impossible to answer in general because there's so yeah. much such a wide space of options. Um, so to give you two concrete examples, I currently do have uh, a half time PhD student. Um, first time in my life, actually, but. We'll see how that works out. So okay. um, no, no, that's not so unusual. Um, industry cooperation highly depends on what you're doing. So I cooperate currently with one, one person who is working full-time at a research lab of a telecommunications uh, manufacturer. But that's a research mm -hmm. lab there, right? And the idea is we will write papers together and that will lead to a PhD. And I can see that happening absolutely. Um, and I've done that in the past. Occasionally, this is not the standard mode of operation, but I don't know, every two years or so, somebody like that comes up. So, yeah, that can work. What usually does not work, you do a standard job that is not related to your research topic, and you try to do that over the weekend or so. Uh, that, that just doesn't fly. There, you don't have enough hours in the day, and, enough, uh, and you do need to sleep, and sometimes also to take a shower. So... That does, I, I would not accept such an arrangement. That doesn't work. Makes sense. Uh, Toby, as you were in industry, did you ever consider trying to convince your employer to, to do it in some kind of uh, yeah, part-time uh, thing with, together with a supervisor or advisor, I should say? Uh, or was that never an, an, an option for you? I, I, I never started a discussion about that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, just because of the same reason uh, Professor Karl just mentioned, I think it is quite unrealistic. Um, but since I'm, I'm working at the university again, I know at least um, three um, PhD students. One of them was working in a, in a research lab in a company. Um, I think he's about to, to graduate soon. The other one is working in, in some, some small company. Um, mm -hmm. I think his progress is also okay. Um, and another one, he was working in the university for a couple of years. I, I don't know the exact number. And then he switched back to an industry position for four times a week. And he used the, 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 the fifth time and the weekend, the fifth day and the weekend to, to further do his research or to further work on his research topic. And that also worked out. Um, I mean, the, the, the time investment will be probably even larger than compared to the full-time university position. I see. Yeah, the problem, the problem here is um, if, if, if somebody uh, is doing all this research on, on, on the weekend and maybe one day of uh, during, uh, during week, um, you have to do that not only for one week or for one month, you have to do that for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And um, that is um, at least uh, the impression I got uh, from, from this um, colleagues. Um, I, have seen in the last years um, following such an approach um, it works out um, one week it works out maybe even for months but in the long term it is very hard because you have to you have to rest you have to to to, to enjoy your time and to relax and um, uh, for for doing a phd um, uh, completely in part time I mean, it's not only switching from one topic uh, from from one topic your work to um, research uh, at the university. You also have um, to take in mind um, that this context switch uh, takes time mentally, yeah. um, uh, uh, and um, so people should clearly think about that hmm. if they want to follow such an approach. This is something that can work if you are basically done with your thesis and you need some finishing touches, and it's sort of I don't know, three months, maybe half a year, then, then that can work. But that's about it. I don't think more, more, more is sustainable. Yeah. And just because you're getting a 40 hours contract in an industry position, that doesn't mean you stay with 40 hours. That exactly. can be also much more. Yeah. And then I think also maybe something that was not mentioned before, I think the, the company has to support the idea of doing an open research in the first place, right? Because I think some companies might, might be interesting in, I don't know, keeping, keeping it secret or a, a business uh, secret for themselves because they want to make money out of it and they wouldn't let you publish openly. So that I think is something that should also be yeah, yeah, okay yeah, with yeah. your company. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we, we now talked a lot 
about money. Um, and that should conclude this, this session. If there's nothing more to, to add from your side, then we can continue. Thank you.